I am Clarence Snyder. I don't know if you heard that before. <laughs> and uh, what I'm going to talk about, I don't know. I just <laughs> talk about what the good Lord tells me to talk about. But I think I'd like to talk about some things I was talking in the car on the way over here today. <coughs> some of the beginnings of AA. We have a speaker tomorrow night who also had his beginning in the Oxford movement where I had my beginning. He came in a little later than that, but he, uh, you'll find he's a very interesting talker. And he has plenty to say, and he, he's not very squeamish about saying it. And when you meet Ed Andy tomorrow night, you'll, I know you'll enjoy him. But he's been in for, for going on to 43 years of sobriety. So uh, I want to tell you something about how I got here and how this AA formed. There was an evolution here. This was not always AA. It amazes me sometimes, and I meet a lot of people around different groups, and they just take this AA situation for granted. They think it has always been here, and something came down from the clouds and dropped, and here we have it. But don't believe it. There was an awful lot of things going on in the beginning of our fellowship. And I was born in the Oxford movement. There was no such thing as AA then. And the Oxford movement was a Protestant evangelical movement. And it was a movement which was designed for sinners. In fact, I have some other books at home and one of the books is entitled for sinners only <laughs> and sinners were to be attracted to this oxford movement there was a preacher a little old minister out of pennsylvania frank buckman wandered over to england and he met some college students at oxford college and he got some of those fellas hepped up on a good way of living through surrendering their lives to Jesus Christ. I'm going on from there. And then this thing grew and it became a worldwide movement. And you would find Oxford group meetings all over the world over in, even in Oriental countries. And they had a different way of obtaining people. Of course, everybody's a sinner. We're born that way. We can't help that. We're made that way. And uh, some are worse than others. <laughs> <laughs> and the Oxford group was dealing with sinners. And along came the rummies. <laughs> and we were the prize examples. <laughs> we were the great unwashed. And we were a great challenge. And uh, there were not very many of them around when I arrived. Very few. There are probably 12 or 14 of them down in Akron going to the Oxford group. And there were a few of them in New York City who were not doing so well, because New York is always smarter than everybody else, and they were very sophisticated, and they didn't like the idea of this God business, and the core of their people up there were either agnostic or atheistic in their leanings, and they did not like to throw this God around too carelessly, and we had quite a time. Now, I came from the Midwest, where we were ignorant. <laughs> and we believed in this God thing. And we're not afraid to talk about God. And, uh, but in New York, they seemed to think that 
if anyone mentioned God, everybody would be scratching and screaming and to get out of the meeting, scare them away. But we did not, I never saw that happen in any meetings I attended over there in Ohio. So there was quite a, quite a uh, to-do between the two factions, and there's always been these two factions in AA, whether you like to admit that or not, or look at it, it's true. Uh, in the Midwest, that was a Bible belt. They used to call us the Bible punchers. <laughs> and they used to laugh at us and think we were really off. But the odd part of it, we were having a great success. Our people were coming in in droves and staying sober and having, and their lives were getting changed. And uh, I can re still remember after our first unity in AA in Cleveland, you know, unity to me is a riot. <laughs> uh, they talk about unity. There's nobody starts a group. No, just because we need a group, somebody gets mad at somebody, <laughs> and they wind up splitting into one or two groups or three groups or something. So I call that unity. <laughs> if we had the kind of unity that they advertise around in some of the publications that people read, we wouldn't have much of an AA. We would have two or three people running the whole show and the rest of them out getting drunk. So uh, it, it looks it's a whole lot different. I think this is a fellowship of people who want to get into a better life, and we are. We want to be redeemed from <coughs> sin. Because if you look at our program, it was taken from the Oxford Movement. There were six steps in the Oxford Movement, and they, all we did when that book was written, we took those six steps and made 12 out of them, figuring, of course, that if alcoholics could screw up six steps, they could screw up 12 much easier, <laughs> which they do. And, uh, but the ideas were the same. We had to admit that we were quick, we, we needed help, we were out of order, our lives were messed up. And then we had to admit that we were helpless as far as changing it. Then the next thing, of course, we turned our will and life over to the care of God. Since we had unmanageable lives, we had to hire a manager. So that's how we hired a manager in step three. And uh, this is all taken, this is all Oxford group stuff. They did the same thing. I remember when Doc Smith had me in the hospital. You'll read a lot about that in that book that a lot of you folks were fortunate in getting. That's a real history of the beginnings of AA. You'll see your hero running all through that book. <laughs> Clarence S. <laughs> You'll find my first wife, Dorothy S. M. in there. And that, that, was, that was quite something. That was a story in itself. Dorothy had thrown me out of the house and her family, her, she had a she came from a very clannish family, and they were always together. They, they invented togetherness. <laughs> and they were always together in my house. <laughs> and they, always, they used to have conferences in my house. But I was never invited to the conferences because I was always a subject under discussion. <laughs> Discussions usually went down the line as to whether they were going to throw me out again out of my own home or let me back in again. And they finally gave me one last chance to stay with that August body. I had been between jobs for several years. <laughs> I was not producing much. Although I had had good positions before. And her brother had a truck. <coughs> And he used to haul merchandise between Cleveland and New York, a big tractor trailer. So this bunch of Earth people, they're all civilians, 
they decided that they, they had a bright idea <coughs> to get me to uh, kill two, two birds with one stone. I should go to work for my brother-in-law, learn to drive this truck and be his helper. It would give me an income and he also could ride herd on me and see if I don't get drunk. Now that's good thinking. See, most people think, alcoholics don't. That's one of the things that hurts people and alcoholics. We, we, alcoholics don't think. The other guy, anytime you see those think signs hanging up in an AA group, you ought to tear them down. It's an insult. <laughs> alcoholics do not think they emote. <laughs> so we never do anything until we feel a certain way. All the thinking in the world will not uh, change it. We don't think. Uh, we, we do things. So things will happen, believe me. Uh, they won't be as a result of thinking things through. <laughs> There's always action of one kind. Well, you see those poor civilians didn't know that. They thought they had a great idea. <clears throat> so they put me on that truck. And I had never lasted on the, with the old boy. I got away from him in Albany, New York. <laughs> I don't have to tell you what happened, but it was a sleeper cab. I was asleep in the back up there behind the driver and he slept on the seat when any sleeping was to be done. Well, I got away from him. He finally got tired out and he had to sleep. <laughs> Pulled the rig over to the curb and said he's going to sleep for a couple hours. Boy, oh boy, me being an everyday drinker and I hadn't had a drink for two days. This was my record. <laughs> and I was dying. I was scared to death. And up in that thing watching that 20 tons of stuff following me through that little window. And I finally got away from him in Albany. I said, this is the capital of New York. I always wanted to see the capital buildings. <laughs> the way I went. It's funny, you know, you some of these crazy things you remember. <coughs> so many things that I don't remember that happened to me when I was drinking. But I remember running down the street to the first watering hole I saw. And I went in there, and one look was enough for me. This place wasn't it wasn't for me, it was too high class, because I only had a dollar and some cents with me. So I beat it down a few blocks and got into a place that was more suitable to a man of my estate. <laughs> a real joint. And something happened, you know. We, we, are, we have angels that watch over us. And so some fair angel watched over me that night. I met a man, I think he was a man, I, and I called him an angel. I think he was a fairy, but I <laughs> Whatever. He started buying me drinks and foreign drinks and as fast as I could drink them. Well, time I got back, I had to sneak out on this fella. I went into the men's room, locked the door and went out the window <laughs> and headed back for the truck. I suppose my fairy friend is still waiting for me. <laughs> so the time I got back there, all those drinks had hit me at once, I expect, because in my efforts to get up in my nest, I stepped on that poor boy's face who was sleeping. <laughs> And church was out. <laughs> and uh, he took me down to the waterfront in New York and threw me out and told me don't ever come back. I just saw, tell you some of these things that show you how God works in our life and, and how, how what strange things happen. I only knew one family in the greater New York, and that was another sister of his. <coughs> And she was also hostile. She was a member of the crew. But, but I figured that Virginia owed me something. And she lived in Yonkers, and I knew where she lived because we went there on our honeymoon. As I say, they did everything together. <laughs> so I knew where she lived. And she lived way up on a hill. But I got out there, and I didn't get up to up that hill. I went down a hill, and I got down in the Italian section. These were bootleg days, and all the Italians have wine. They make it, they, some of them sold it, some of them drank it, and some of them shared it with their friends. 
and I went down and made friends. <laughs> and by the time I got up to Virginia's house, I was very friendly. <laughs> and I can only remember a couple incidents. I'm drunk, I'm dirty, I smell bad, and she had two little girls, little babies, I don't know, it was two, three or four years old, just little kids. And I'm rolling around on the floor with these two little girls. And they're having a great old time with Uncle Clarence. But Virginia didn't think much of this. So she put me in her car and took me back down in New York and threw me out where her brother threw me out. I tell her that for this reason. I want to show you how God works. This program wasn't put together by a bunch of geniuses. But God's hand is in everything that happened here. I, I was left. I was on a bum in New York, and I was a little bit sharper, I think, than some of those goofballs down there. I never had to buy a meal in New York. I never paid a night's lodging. I never bought any clothes, and I always had a good place to sleep clean. What happened, I went down there and I, these truckers would pull their outfits in there after they dropped their, their load. Their load, the union used to take the trailer and take it wherever it's supposed to go. These men parked their tractors down in this place and a lot of them didn't want to sleep in their tractors. So they wanted to get a cheap hotel where they get to get a bath and they'd be having a night or so on the town while they're waiting for a load to go back to wherever they came from. So they hired me as a watchman, if you please. <laughs> and I sleep in a truck every night. And I'm in demand. <laughs> I hadn't made a nickel in several years. And they're paying me 50 cents a night to sleep in these trucks. They could have taken the truck with me in it. <laughs> no, I, I had two jugs all, all the time. I, I drank I drank derail. It's denatured alcohol mixed with water. The total cost of it, if you figure it right down, was seven cents a pint. That's how much I paid for my booze. Now for fifty cents a day you can't drink that much. <laughs> Impossible. So I'm saving money. <laughs> Success in New York. Well, uh, I don't want to go into the long story about how I ate for free. It's a little bit blurred and it's a little bit unbelievable. But yeah, I'll tell you. <laughs> Maybe you might get in this situation sometime. <laughs> but I discovered something in New York City. I'm, I'm a guy that's always, I'm a regular Robinson Crusoe. I'm always sticking my nose into things and trying to, trying to find something, especially something I can pick up and steal. And uh, so I got walking around down New York and I discovered something remarkable in New York City, the automat. Have you any of you people ever been in Philadelphia or New York know about the automat? Unfortunately, I read in the paper a short time ago that they have closed the automats. Now that's a, that's a, a total loss, do a thing like that. Because they, were, they meant a lot to me in my life at the time. New York, I noticed something about people. I, I'm a great people watcher. And everybody's in a hurry in New York. If you ever want to get crushed, just start walking past some of those office buildings at noontime when they all went out for lunch. And they all come streaming out of there. It's like a riot. Uh, they get a half hour for lunch, some of them, most of them, I suppose, or maybe an hour. And they don't have time to go get a meal in peace. And if they go to the take any real time, it's going to cost them too much money anyway, so they head for the automat, a lot of them do. Well, they're in such a rush to get back, they order their stuff, they put their nickels in that machine, and out comes their soup and their pie and whatever else they're buying, they get their little meal, 
They, a lot of them don't even sit down to eat. They stand up at tables, stand up there and eat. And they're talking to each other while they're eating now. They don't even know what they're eating. <laughs> and they're going at it. And I watched this performance, and it gave me an idea. Alkies get ideas. I decided this is a good way I can get food for nothing. It takes a little bit of crust to do this. <laughs> and there's a certain risk attached to it. <laughs> I will go out the curbstone, I rub one hand in that mud and dirt in the gutter. And I get up alongside of a couple of these guys that are busy eating, and I reach over and put my hand on one of them's plate. <laughs> the dirty one. Well, the first thing this guy wants to do is clock, clock me, you know. And I look at him and starving to death, you know, it's like a baleful look on my face. And he can't hit me. It something happens to humans are funny, you know. <laughs> he should belt hell out of me, but he can't. So what does he do? He gets so exasperated he walks away and leaves the whole thing. That's just what I want in the first place. <laughs> So I take that drug back to the truck with me. So I, I didn't have to eat every day. I wasn't much for eating anyway, but you have to eat so much to keep so to survive. So if ever you ever get in real <laughs> remember that. There's ways of getting things. You never have to be without. <clears throat> Clothes, I got what I needed at the missions. I couldn't eat their food. I couldn't stand it. I can't stand to be. I can't stand the smell of a mission today. The, that bug juice floating around every day. You go in there and they squirt everybody with bug, bug juice. And, <laughs> my God, and that stuff just permeates everything in the place and all the food. And those bakeries would give the these missions old buns and donuts and stuff that they couldn't sell, they took them to the missions. And all they do, they lay in there absorbing bug juice. <laughs> and people wouldn't be eating them, I think they'd turn them over to another mission. <laughs> and on and on, you couldn't eat this stuff. At least I couldn't. So I, I, I that wasn't my bit. But anyway, I didn't have to, I had my free lodging. I got clothes. When I needed clothes, you go to the mission and you sing. You gotta sing. <laughs> you don't have to be much of a singer, but you sing. And you'll find some of the people go to the choir tomorrow, choir practice. They're not quite great singers, but they can sing and then they'll pass. But you go to a mission and sing and they give you what you need. Shoes or pants or coat or whatever your needs are. So I never had to buy anything. I was living on Easy Street. So that, I tell you that for a reason. I was in New York City a long time. I don't know how long. But I know it had to be a good year because it was winter time again when I left. I know one calendar went around, I know that. <laughs> I had no reason for keeping track of time. And uh, I wanted to go home. I wasn't welcome, but I wanted to go home. And one trucker took me to Erie, and another one brought me into the outskirts of Cleveland, where I live. Well, and here's what happened. After I'd been to Virginia's house, rolling around on the floor with those two kids. Now, here's a, here's a miracle. A few days later, she had a doctor over, a family doctor and a family friend. And they got to talking about drinking. And she recited this instance of this drunken brother-in-law of hers, who used to be such a nice guy, her favorite brother-in-law, and what a no-good drunken bum he is now. And this doctor says, that's odd. He says, I have a brother-in-law who's a lush. And he met some strange cult down here at Calvary House in New York. Mm -hmm. And ever since he met this cult, he runs around in New York trying to fix drunks. He don't have much luck with the drunks. They come in and smash up his furniture and stuff like that. But it keeps him sober. And he said there's a doctor, Robert Smith, in Akron, Ohio, who is also a lush, and he belongs to that strange cult down in Akron. 
And he said, if you ever, your brother-in-law ever gets back to Cleveland, maybe he can go down and see this Dr. Smith, and this Dr. Smith can fix him. We used to call it fix him. So, of course, I don't know this is going on. That doctor who Virginia's talking to was Dr. Leonard Strong, who happens to be Bill Wilson's brother-in-law. Bill Wilson was going to the Oxford Group, the Calvary House in New York. Doc Smith was going to the Oxford Group in Akron, Ohio. Okay. There, I am getting indirectly in contact with the two people who are accredited with starting this whole ball of wax, and I know nothing about it. And I'm 600 miles away from home. I don't know either one or never heard of anyone, either one of these birds. Now you tell me what that is. If that isn't God's hand working, I'd like to know what it is. See? So eventually I got home. One trucker took me far away. I finally got to my house out in Lindhurst, Ohio. And this, this is a, in a snow, oh boy, that is a snow belt out there. And I got up on my front porch, and the screen doors were still up. Dorothy didn't have anyone take the screens down. And I pounded on the door. She came to the door, but she did not unhook that screen door. And I tried all my wiles and salesmanship trying to get her to open that door so I could get in the house. But she was adamant, and had no, no soap. I wasn't about to get in that house. I pointed out about those screens. I told her, people don't leave screens up all winter. She needs a man around the house to do these jobs. <laughs> she allowed us how she needed a man around the house, but she didn't need one that badly. So I didn't get in. But Virginia had written her about this Dr. Smith in Akron. And Dorothy, <coughs> talking to me through the screen, she asked me if I'd like to go down and meet this doctor who fixes drunks. Well, I got nothing to lose. I can transact my business in Akron as well as I can in Cleveland or any place else. <laughs> so she took me down, put me in a car and took me down to the bus depot, gave me Doc Smith's name and address, and bought me a one-way ticket to Akron and got rid of me. <laughs> and that's how I met my sponsor. Eventually, Doc put me in Akron City Hospital where I met the first members who were in Akron, and there were not too many of them at that time. And I got a bunch of surprises. I didn't know what they were going to do to me. I was looking for some kind of an operation. <laughs> this, yeah. And Doc Smith, when I first went down there to see him, he wasn't in his office. And I waited for a long time for him. It was warm in there. I walk back and forth, and I, every time I pass his door, I read his name on there. Dr. Robert Holbrook Smith, rectal surgeon. <laughs> this is certainly a new approach to know. <laughs> anyway, I stayed in there. It was warm. And finally, Doc came in, and any of you folks, uh, Andy knew Doc very well. Andy knew Doc 10 years before he ever sobered up. But Doc was a big, gangly guy, and he was a man of few words, but they were all meaningful. He didn't waste any words. Doc was not scared of this guy. I don't want to go into the story why I was afraid of him, but uh, there's a story connected with it. Take me too long to tell it. But anyway, he took me into his office, through his reception room, through another room, into a back room, and he sat down. And I, like you know, like everybody else, you go to a doctor. And you're supposed to tell him your symptoms. So I started telling Doc my symptoms, but he took the ball away from me, and he started telling me all about myself. <coughs> Well, he scared the liver out of me when he did this because something odd had been happening up in Cleveland for, for the past couple of years previous to this. Nellie would know about this, I'm sure. They had what they call the Torso Murder Mystery. The Kingsbury Run was a hobo hangout, and it ran for miles. 
there. It was a jungle. And a lot of hobos stayed there, lived down there. And every once in a while, they'd find one of these hobos all dissected, all cut in pieces, and all the pieces wrapped in newspaper. And they never identified any of these people. And as to my knowledge, they, there is seven or eight of them that they found. The newspapers had a great time with this. Every time they found a body, that was front page news. So they were presuming that whoever was doing this little job was either a butcher or a surgeon because he had a fine technique and he, he knew anatomy. Okay? So I'm in there talking to and this, this is this used to bother me. This this really because these are some of my buddies, you know. They were my peers that were getting cut up. Well anyway, Doc is talking to me and Finally, I, I'm, I'm scared of this guy to start with. And finally, he made the mistake of all mistakes. He told me he's going to put me out in a nut house outside of Akron, of Cuyahoga Falls, a funny farm with rubber rooms, and uh, where nobody can get at me, he said. Where nobody can get at me. <coughs> all of a sudden, it dawned on me He'd been telling me all about myself, and I can't figure out how this guy knows so much about me. So when he wanted to put me someplace where nobody could get at me, it dawned upon me, he's the mad butcher. <laughs> <laughs> and as soon as, boy, I, I was fright. As soon as he turned his head, bang, I was gone. I never waited for any elevator, and he was on the sixth floor of the second floor of the elevator. No way I waited. That's how I met my sponsor. But eventually, I went back on a dare. I had an argument with another drunk in a bottle thing, and this guy shamed me into going back. You know, I don't know how many of you people have ever been in a bottle gang. But back in those depression days, that, that, was the, that was the in thing. Because people had no money, and we had to stick together to survive. And we drank anything, anything. I mean anything. There was no such thing as going and buying stuff like people do today at a liquor store. That was ridiculous. We couldn't have that kind of money anyway. So <coughs> we were sitting around bunch of us drunk one day, some of them were down, some were up, and I made, you know, you like to start something among your peers, you like to initiate things. So I made this bland statement that I was going to quit drinking. And this flannel mouth Irishman, he was a tough guy, he was a head, he was a head mogul in this bunch, he was a tough guy. He said, you, you'll never quit drinking. I said, I am going to quit. He'll never quit. You don't have guts enough to quit drinking. Now, he's drunk, too, don't forget. <laughs> he says, to quit drinking takes determination. He says, and to have determination, you have to have a chin. He says, look at you. You've got a chin like Andy Gump. You're no damn good. <laughs> he says, I am going to quit. I know a doctor in Akron can fix me. He says, nobody can fix you. You're no damn good. He says, I'll show you. He said, you show me. I don't know whose phone I used because we didn't have telephone service in our facilities there. <laughs> but Doc told me I called him six or eight times and uh, arranged to meet him the next day at the city hospital. And that's what I did. I went down to that hospital and that was on the 11th day of February, 1938. And I have never had a drink to this day. <laughs> Let me tell you what they did to me. Now remember, I have a lot of suspicions about this doctor. <laughs> so I'm in the hospital, and a few men they had, Andy can remember how we used to do this thing, they came out to visit me. They were all older men than I was, 10, 15, 20 years older than I was. I was only 35 years old. They told me their stories or their careers or what had happened to them through booze. And 
every one of them told me the same thing before he left. He says he had the answer to my drinking problem. But on that note, he left. He didn't tell me what the answer was. So I'm in there looking for an operation or anything that might happen. <coughs> so the last day I'm in the hospital, Doc came in and I'm scared to death of this man yet. And he was a big six foot four, five guy. Fingers on him this long. I think they were a great help to him in his profession. <laughs> uh, but he, he used to pound on me with his fingers, stick him in my chest. I hate anybody who does that. And he'd come in, he'd always every afternoon come in, sit on the foot of my bed and look at me. And uh, I was wondering what coming next. So I'm there for my last day. I, so he says, well, you're going to leave here today, this evening. I says, well, he says, uh, what do you think of all this by now? I says, well, Doc, I think it's wonderful, all these men coming in to see me and telling me the story of their life. But I'm puzzled about one thing. He says, and what's that? I says, tell them, they all told me that they have the answer to my drinking problem. Then they leave. They don't tell me what the answer is. What are you going to do with me? What happens next? He says, well, we don't know about you. You're a young fella. We've had no success with these young guys. You're all screwballs. <laughs> See, that's 35. All these guys are 45, 50, and on and on. Well, I wasn't going to argue <coughs> that point with him, but finally, I can, must have convinced him that I was ready to do anything. He says, okay then. He says, get out of that bed. I said, for a while. <laughs> get out of that bed and get down on your knees. Ooh. <laughs> so I piled out of that bed and got on my knees, a shorty nightgown. An old doc approaches me and I'm thinking about this operation. Here. <laughs> Believe me, some funny things went through my head. But what did he do? I said, what am I going to do down there? You're going to pray. I said, who's going to pray? He said, you're going to pray. I said, I don't know anything about praying. <coughs> he says, I don't suppose you do. He says, I will pray and you can repeat it after me. That'll do for this time, he said. So he hauls me out down there on the floor, that cold concrete floor on my bare knees. And he put his hand on my head and he uttered a prayer, which I followed. <coughs> That's how I was introduced to this. That night he took me to this Oxford group meeting at he, Henry Williams' home in Akron, Ohio. So I go to that meeting and there were a few alcoholics there. There was a whole room full of people there. A lot of ladies there all dressed up and everybody seemed to be having a good time enjoying each other. There were about a dozen <laughs> rummies there, but there were other 40, 50 people who were civilians, the earth people. And uh, <clears throat> this meeting went on. And I didn't know what's going on. I, I couldn't figure out. What, and still all screwed up up here. But somebody opened the meeting, they prayed, and they read the Bible. And then after they got through, this guy witness and told all about his sins and how he'd been getting over and beating these sins. And then other people popped up all over the audience and telling about what victories they'd been having over their sins of late. Of course, it's a lot of this go over my head, but I was there. And I went to those meetings, I attended those meetings in Akron. He told me when I went home, he said, you go back to Cleveland and spend the rest of your life fixing rummies as an avocation. Tell me that. And one other thing he did, which startled me no little, I looked across that room among those ladies, and there is my wife, Dorothy, who had ordered me out of the house forever. 
and he apparently had talked to her and talked her into letting me come back for another shot at home. And she came down and she took me back home to Cleveland. And I stayed there with her, oh, better than a year, and she threw me out sober. <laughs> well, anyway, those things happen. And there's reasons for it. I don't blame her for it. I, she didn't know any better. She did what she thought was right. So I hold no ill will. Well, anyway, he told me to fix, go out fixing drunks. Well, there was no shortage of drunks. This is depression time, and the woods were full of them. A lot of men just homeless, wandering around. So what did I know about fixing drunks? I walk up to some drunk on the street, and I'd say, hey, you ought to quit drinking. You ought to be like me. It's a great approach. Try it sometime. <laughs> After you get belted around a few times, you really change your approach. <laughs> but you know I talk to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of alcoholics, dipsomaniacs, dizzy people, crazy people, what drunks, what have you. For seven months, I talked to hundreds of people about quitting drinking. I went and called on all the preachers, I went to the police, I went to the judges, I went to the social workers, telling them all if they had problems with the drunks, send them to me, and I'd fix them. This went on for seven months, till I finally sold my first baby. When I listen to some of this crap I hear in AA today, about this being a program of attraction, it makes me sick. I feel like throwing up. This is a sales job, the greatest sales job in the world. In attraction, who wants to get attracted to a bunch of drunks anyway? <laughs> the last thing anybody wants to get tangled up with. Well, anyway, I finally sold my first guy, and that's a story I could write a book about, and got him in a hospital, and something happened immediately thank you now that's a kind of a oh i gotta take my pill I must be running down <laughs> i take so many pills that i don't you have to eat lunch anymore <laughs> sick like that. Well, anyway, uh, after that, after Bill Hess we got him at the hospital, I had, Bill was a, he was, couldn't help himself, he was helpless. And I had a guy that couldn't get away from me, I had a captive audience. <laughs> Bill, Bill Hess was Polish. And he'd been an auditor for Sir Owen Williams Paint Company for years, but been fired for being drunk all the time. And he hadn't seen his family in years, and they lived right in Cleveland. And Bill, I had never seen this before, nor I don't remember ever seeing it since. But this man was paralyzed drunk. And I mean paralyzed. He could not move a muscle. He could talk. He knew what I was saying, but he couldn't move. He was lying there on his back on the floor, and he was a big man. And I got down there and next to Bill, and I asked him the usual question, how would you like to quit drinking? And he was all for it. I called Doc Smith and told him I have a baby. I'm ringing down. We didn't call them, what well, do people call them all kinds of things now? We call them babies. I had a baby that was bringing down and have a room ready in which he would do. And I got a few of the other rummies there to help me put him in my car. And away I went and dumped him into the hospital in Akron. I tell you, kids, I walked this high off the ground. I finally had succeeded. 
I never thought I'd ever be a real member of that bunch until I had sponsored <coughs> someone. And I went at this thing with really, uh, put real energy and time into it, but no brains. But I finally sold my first baby, and he couldn't help himself. <laughs> but something happened <coughs> right after that, bing, 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 bing. Got a whole flock of guys, got about a dozen of them. Now, I mentioned a while ago that the Oxford movement, they were all wound up in the Oxford group down there in Akron. I mentioned a while ago that this was a Protestant evangelical society. Well, Bill Hess was a Polish fellow and had been a Catholic, I'm sure not a very good one, but that's <laughs> what he had allegiance to. And then we had an Irish invasion. Out of the first dozen men going to Akron, seven of them had professed being Catholics. I took them down to these meetings, and they looked at each other, and they told me they can't go to these meetings because their church would not permit it. There was guys that hadn't been in church in six years and told me all about the church. <laughs> That's the way the people are, so they can't go. Well, the only thing I can do is get out and talk to my sponsor about it. By this time, you know, I hadn't been sober too long, but we had our conflab, and I told them that we just told him why. He says, well, we're not keeping the Catholics out. He says, no, we're not keeping them out, but their church keeps them out. It's the same thing. They can't come. He says, well, that's their tough luck. No, that's not their tough luck, Doc. We don't need that. We have a book now. We wrote that book in the fall of 1938, and it came out in February of 39. And this is May of 39. I'm talking about three months after the book came out. I said, we have a book with 12 steps, and, the, and we have the four absolutes of honesty, unselfishness, purity, and love. Anyone can live by that, no matter what kind of religion he may or may not have. He says, well, you can't do that. I said, I can't do what? He said, you can't break this up. I said, I'm not trying to break anything up. I'm trying to open it up so everybody can get in. And boy, was there a riot. Next week, I went down to Akron and made the announcement at the meeting that this is the last time the Cleveland contingent would be down here as a group. We were starting our own group in Cleveland, Ohio, and I made the mistake of giving them the address. 2345 Stillman Road, Cleveland Heights, next Thursday night. I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Boy, we had a riot in Akron that night. Clarence, you can't do this. You've got to come down and talk about it. There's nothing to talk about. It's done. It was awful. Well, those are people that are so good to us, and they, you know, they, we owe our birth to them, and here we're shutting them out, and shutting them out completely. I didn't mention that there's friction coming between the alcoholics and the civilians by this time anyway. So next Thursday night when we had our meeting in Cleveland, that whole bloody bunch came up from Akron <laughs> and descended upon us and tried to break up our meeting. And one guy, old Bill Jones, he was going to whip me. And I'm sure this was all done in pure Christian love. <laughs> However, we stood our ground and that's how we started. That was the first AA group in the world in May of 1939. That was when we had to break from the Oxford group. We had a lot of trouble with the Oxford group for a while. I, we got hospitals set up, and I even invited them to use our <coughs> hospital set up, and then they abused the privilege. They'd come in with an AA book sitting there on the side of a bed. They'd throw it underneath the bed, tell the guy not to read it, you know. So of course we had to kick them out of our activity. And they tried an activity of their own. Eventually, they had to join in with the AAs. That's how AA started. And it spread. We got all this publicity in Cleveland, in the Cleveland Plain Dealer, and in the Clevelander, that magazine, 
we got a lot of lots of publicity and all and some preacher preached a sermon about me he used my story he was a poor old guy he was a smart guy but he knew nothing about about uh, he, he was a unitarian minister so figure out what he knew about jesus and the rest of it so uh, but he tried to fix me but he was unsuccessful. If I told you the things those guys did, he, he, they're, they're really they're laughable. <coughs> but it, he, he really tried. So when I was sober a year, I went back to see him. I thought I owed him something. And when I walked into his office, he didn't know me. He'd never seen me dry. He never saw me clean at that time. He didn't know me. And I'd taken on a little weight by then. And man, he lost his mind. There never was anything in history where alcoholics had been cured before. Nothing, never, nothing. I have a book home about so thick on the history of alcoholism that was written in the early 1800s. And boy, the efforts that were tried with alcoholics and none of them ever worked. And here's something that's working. And a lot of people got curious and had beaten my door down. And uh, our group just, we got all kinds of good publicity. And of course, the first thing that happened, people misunderstand anonymity. And this is nothing new. They still do, and they did then. There were some people in the original group. Now get this picture. These are these Irishmen that I had knocked my brains out chasing around for months and finally got them in the group. And I got that nut out of a nut house there, Elric Davis. He was a newspaper man. He wrote these articles in the Cleveland Plain Dealer. And those articles went all, people would clip them out and send them all over the country to this Uncle Slug out here in Nebraska or something. And I was running correspondence courses in AA at home. And besides, all of those inquiries that were coming in. Inquiries come into the plane leader, they come into Dr. Lupton, and they all wound up in my lap. So every Monday morning, I give every man a handful of these inquiries and tell him to go out and chase them down and see what he could do with them and report to me on Wednesday what he did, just like a sales manager. And they did it. They did it. They worked like beavers. And boy, that group just grew and grew and grew. And we were pretty rough about the way we handled people. Uh, today it's all together different. Anybody can walk in an AA group now. They couldn't do that in those days. Somebody had to bring you. And somebody had to sponsor you. <coughs> so the sponsor was not, he was responsible for teaching you this program and seeing to it that you got started right. And he had a job on his hands. People don't do that anymore. The, one of the most ridiculous things I hear in AA meetings today some new person will come in, let's say, go get yourself a sponsor. Can you imagine some thing bad coming in AA, <laughs> picking out a sponsor for himself? <laughs> you know who he's going to pick. He's going to pick another thing bad just like him. <laughs> anybody that's good. They've got to put any pressure on him. So it's ridiculous. We had a system. Uh, the way we brought people in. And we allowed no outsiders. Wife and a husband. The family was welcome. They were all family groups. They were welcome. But we met in a lot of churches because they were cheap. Some of them didn't charge us anything. And they all had good facilities. They all had cups and saucers and stoves and we'd do our coffee and have our little refreshments after. And the ministers and the pastors of these churches were not allowed to come to their meeting in their own in their own church without the express invitation from the group. That's how rough we were on letting people stick their nose in our activity. That's why we had a lot of success. We didn't have a lot of these screwballs coming in here that don't have any business in AA screwing things up. We're screwed up bad enough to start with. We don't need any help. So that's how things went. I've had a lot, I could talk for hours on experiences in AA. 
and interesting things and the way groups started that you never hear about. Now, some of you folks are very fortunate tonight. You've got copies of that Dr. Bob and a good old timer. If you didn't get one, buy one. It tells you the story that has never been told about the formation of AA before. New York has chosen to keep a lot of those things out of people's knowledge. <laughs> and I think the reason this book was written, I think, now I'm only surmising, I was writing a book on the history of AA and they found out about it. And they thought, oh, this guy's gonna really, really screw it up. <laughs> so they hired a man to go out and write this book. And he came down and spent a week with us at our home. And he taped every conversation we had. And I gave him names of people all over the country whom the New York knew nothing about. And he went clear across the country and called on all these people and taped every conversation. He did a tremendous job in putting that book together. He worked for the New York office. The poor fella, just before the book came out, he died. I remember when he left our home that day, Grace said to me, gee, that fellow's color is awful bad. He looks bad. He, he's gray. He doesn't look well. And by golly, it wasn't six months later, he was dead. But he did something. That book is the best thing that's ever come out of New York outside of the big book. And I recommend everyone reading and rereading that book. And knowing what kind of a society you're in here. This notion of AA just happening, this is a lot of hogwash. There was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, a lot of conniving, a lot of all kinds of stuff went on in those early days. A lot of stuff that wouldn't look good in print, mm -hmm. believe me. And uh, it's some of it's still going on. <laughs> <laughs> you get a bunch of rubbies together, boy, and you can expect anything to happen. But we have a program, and if people will accept this program, it's foolproof. You can't ever drink again if you accept and apply the AA program. It's impossible. I don't sponsor new people anymore. I don't have the time. But I have people, when I do find a new person, I usually turn him over to someone who I've talked to before and taken through the steps and let them work on him. They need that exercise. But what I get is this. I get people who have been around AA or in AA. Some have been dry, some of them haven't over a period of year, years. And they hear about this nut down in Castleberry, Florida, who has some peculiar way of fixing drunks in two days. It takes you through the steps in two days and you never drink anymore and you have a good life. Now this sounds pretty good to a lot of people, you know. And I try and they call. I, I don't get very many people from around Orlando, of course. A prophet is without honor in his own home. I'm a bum there, but I go 100 miles away, I'm an authority. <laughs> but these people mostly come from different parts of the state or out of the state. And they're sincere people. I don't want them to come unless they are. And when they come, I have a qualification for them. And here's what I do with every one of those persons. First of all, I want to know that you are an alcoholic. And I want you to know it, and I want you to admit it. Now, how do I know you are an alcoholic? Well, after 45 years of fooling around with rummies, if I don't know an alcoholic when I run into one, they better lock me up for good. Because alcoholics are different than people. <laughs> All the good are different than people. We are in a class by ourselves. Our characteristics are the same. I don't say that some civilians don't have some of our characteristics, but they don't have all of them. But every one of us has the same pattern as far as the way we're put together. 
our processes up here. I don't talk about thinking processes because they don't think. An alcoholic, don't ever catch an alcoholic thinking, they're real trouble. <laughs> but <clears throat> no, they're all alike. And after conversation, I can ascertain to my satisfaction that the person's an alcoholic, he or she's an alcoholic, and he or she admits it. A lot of them don't know what an alcoholic is. Never been explained to them. You know, and most people, all of them, not most of them, every alcoholic I've ever met has a very poor opinion of himself. His feeling of self-worth is next to zero. And I tell him what a great guy he is. And I prove it to him that he's different than people. And he's got something that these other people don't have. And don't ever try to be like those people. Be you. And I teach him how. How do we do this? <coughs> do this by taking them into the steps. I have a way of uh, these questions I ask. First of all, I want to know if it's an alcoholic and he finally admits he is. The next thing I ask him is this, what do you want to do about it? A lot of people don't want to do anything about it. A lot of people will quit or I'll quit for them, see? So I want to know what they'll do. So I say to them, what are you willing to do to quit drinking forever? I don't say anything about quit drinking for 24 hours or 24 years. Forever. That's a long time, especially for some ding bat that has never had a week's sobriety in his life. <laughs> You get some funny answers on that one sometimes. <clears throat> Where do I get that from? That's in the book. It says, if you want what we have and are willing to go to any lengths to get it, you are now ready to take certain steps. That's what it says in the book. I didn't make that up. But people don't throw this at their people when they come in. They let anybody walk in and sit down on a chair. And half the people sitting in a lot of these meetings I've been in don't even belong there. You know, I'm more alcoholic than I'm an astronaut. <laughs> so, yeah. well, they got nothing else to do. They're curious, or they're lonesome, or something. They're looking for a broad, or looking for a cow. There's something going on all the time. It's a good place, sir. People have no friends, they come in and they, and they accept everybody. Let them talk and let them, let them be something. And they don't belong in there at all. We are filled up with people like that. An alcoholic is an unusual person. And I don't think there's over 8 to 10 percent of the population who can be alcoholic. This is a privilege reserved for a chosen few. <laughs> And if you're an alcoholic, and if you will go in under this plan, willing to go to any lengths, when he tells me that he's willing to go to any lengths, the ball's in my court then. He can't back up on me. The minute he backs up and starts something, I say, hey, Buster, what did you tell me a while ago? Are you willing to do anything? I just give me some of this stuff, go home. You don't go home. Quiets him down real quick. They want to get well or they wouldn't come clear from Indianapolis or Mobile or someplace to, or California to get fixed up. But you have to take control of it and put that program in the way it is. We have a tremendous program. I have never heard, I've never heard of a person who has come and gone through the program this way that's ever fallen off. Oh, that speaks for itself. But I take them down through those steps, and the people, when they read these steps, they read that first step. It says that I'm powerless over alcohol, but they don't hear the rest of it. Their life is unmanageable. They don't hear that at all. And that's the big problem. It's not the alcohol, it's the unmanageable life. <laughs> They never hear that. Step one. 
Step two says I came to believe that a power greater than myself can restore me to sanity. So some dingbat likes to say a power, uh, they can put anything as their god. They can take that radio or, or stand here, a table, a lamp. That's their, that's their god. I hate, I will uh, trust my everlasting soul to the help of a chair or a table or a light bulb. But you hear this crap. And why do you hear it? You know why you hear this stuff? It's that thing they put in there as I understand him. You know why that was put in there? When this book was written, I'll tell you a little secret. A lot of people don't know this. And you'll never get it in any literature, I'll tell you that. When this book was written, there was an awful, as I mentioned before, a lot of fuss between New York and, and the Midwest about God. And the atheistic agnostic circle up there in Gotham didn't want to emphasize God. But we nuts over there in the Midwest, us Bible thumpers, we came right out with him. God. And when the book was written, they wanted to tone the God business down in New York, Art Thurston Wilson and Burwell. And so an awful argument ensued. Parkhurst, who was Wilson's buddy and partner, he did all the legwork on that book. You never hear about Hank. Some other. There's one reference in that book to Henry P. But I not tell you who he is. Well, anyway, Hank did all the legwork on this thing. Those people wanted to cut out the God thing, and we were having a battle between Akron and New York on God. So Hank had found a printer, not a publisher, a printer, who promised to print our book for us in a slow season of his business. So he gave us a cutoff date. We should have that book in there. Well, this argument went on and on by mail between the two cities. And finally, we saw that we had to do something or this book was never going to be printed. So we compromised and put God as I understand him in italics to suit the agnostic, atheistic circle. And that, a lot of people say that's a great thing. I think it's one of the worst things that ever happened. Amen. Amen. Because people don't get right down to the nitty gritty of this and turn their will and life over to the care of God. When a man or a woman comes to our house, Grace and I do this, both of us work. She does more of it than I do now. And, you know, well, she'll have to do a lot more of it than I do. I'm not capable now to do too much. But people come here, and when we get their commitment that they're willing to do anything, when that third step comes along, they take that third step on their knees, just like I did in the hospital. Bingo. And they get down to the sixth step, they're down there again. Okay. I ask to have everything taken away. See, when I have a list of 20 questions that I ask people on step four, and I mark them because they tell me they have these different trifugalies, and they have to, they're impossible. They can't help themselves. Their life is unmanageable. So they hire this manager, and they have to get the manager to take this stuff away from them. They can't get rid of all these <coughs> nasty, stinking things. Everybody doesn't have 20 of these, these defects of character. Usually 10 or 12 they have. I've only met one man in my experience that had all 20. Well, I met two. 
And I met one girl that had 19. She was a star. <laughs> Came over from South Carolina. You didn't expect anything out of her. <laughs> but, those questions, I have them on a paper. And they tell me whether they have resentments and whether they have hates and whether they're dishonest. And all these different things enviousness and jealousy and, and or the gossip and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, they tell me, so then we, how are we going to get rid of them? They've got them, they've been living with them for years, and they can't get rid of them. So they have to ask their manager to take them away from them. So they do that on step seven. And the manager takes them away. They don't have them anymore. That sounds simple, doesn't it? And it is, it is simple. But people resist this kind of thing. They say, oh, you're talking religion. What's the matter with religion? We're not talking religion. We're talking what was taught us in the good book. Our whole program emanates from the Sermon on the Mount and the book of James in the Bible. So if you want to know what these steps are, read the 5th, 6th, 7th chapter of Matthew and the book of James. You'll find Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which is the greatest sermon he ever preached. He preached those to the disciples. And the, the book of James is a healing ministry. And if anybody needs any healing, we're the chickens that need it. We need it. And it tells us the uh, theme of that book is faith without works is dead. So when we get something, we got to do something about it and go out and go to work. You find the people who are happy and having a good thing in AA and having a good life. They're the people that are doing these things. They're not the smart ones, the dumb ones. They're too dumb to accept this stuff. <coughs> You don't believe it, ask anybody in New York. <laughs> Be stupid. We, out we outsmart ourselves a long time. We have a simple program. All we have to do is believe it and use it. You don't, if you have trouble believing it, I'll point people out to you that have done it. Look at them. Watch how they live. And look how some of these other smarties are living. Eh? Stay with the dummies. They don't know any better. They know they need help. And they scream for it and they accept the help. And the help's there for every one of us. This is a life-changing program. We come here to get our life changed. And that's exactly what it's for. I was going to make a short talk tonight, but I get off on some of these things, and they're always new to me, and it's good for me to talk about them. It does me good. I don't know why anybody who has benefit of things in AA isn't anxious to get out and tell about it to people. Talk about it. Anonymity, all that BS. That's, that's, that's all. Hogwash. What does it mean? You know what anonymity means? That's what it means to me. Is what it always meant. I don't care who in the world knows I belong to AA. You have my permission to tell anybody in the world that Clarence Snyder belongs to AA. God knows I've done it enough myself. You've seen it enough in the newspapers. <laughs> and I've had enough hell for it. But. I have no right to go out and tell anybody that Chuck here belongs to AA. I have no right to do this without his permission. It's just a courtesy. 
Very few people in AA need anonymity. <laughs> My God in heaven, some bum lay there in the gutter for 20 years. <laughs> people stepping over him, talking about him, and getting thrown out of jobs and thrown out of his house and out of his family, getting thrown out of here. And he starts to get well, and he's afraid to tell anybody about it. <laughs> I want everybody to know I belong to AA. I'm proud of it. Everybody can't belong to this, boy. We're a, we're a select group. Don't forget it. Grace goes out and tells everybody she's a rummy. That's the first thing she tells people. She's nuts. <laughs> You know what she did? I'll tell you a couple things. You know, you, you like to get a chance. She can't back talk me out. <laughs> when we were going to get married, she was looking around for a wedding gown. She couldn't find anything around where she was, so she went down to Daytona. And uh, she's in one of those fancy shoppies. When it's got an E on the end, look out, that's funny. <laughs> so she went in one of these places and she was talking to this gal about getting a gown and she told her it was going to be her wedding gown. Oh, she said, oh, she's already told this gal she's an alcoholic. That's the first thing. I'm Grace, I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> So this gal says, well, who are you going to marry? She says, I am going to marry Clarence Snyder. She says, you're going to marry Clarence Snyder? He nearly broke my home up once. <laughs> he figured in my divorce, that was what she said. Well, it seems that she and her husband belong to the same group in St. Pete where I belong. And we were all friends. But they got unfriendly, and they got fighting and disagreeing, so they decided to divorce. And they had a tomcat. They had gotten a little kitten who was a tomcat, and it grew into quite a cat. And they particularly liked me, and they named this tomcat Clarence. <laughs> so the big argument came with the divorce is who was going to get Clarence? <laughs> I didn't give a damn about the furniture and the bank account. Clarence was the thing that was important. <laughs> and for a while she thought her wedding was off but she heard the whole story. <laughs> <laughs> I was on a plane one time coming in and Grace had gone in the back part of the plane somewhere and she could stretch out on the seat and sleep. And I was snoozing in the seat of where I was and she usually tries to take up a couple of seats when she goes to sleep if it's available. And I'm dozing off there and somebody's shaking me and there's a stewardess comes up. She wakes me up. She says, what's with you? Are we falling? <laughs> <laughs> she said, no, I just met your wife back there. And she's told me that she's in AA. And she said, you are too. She says, so am I. I just came in in Atlanta three weeks ago. She tells everybody she's in AA. <laughs> Anonymity. I don't know where it ever hurt anybody. Yeah. It's impossible. You ought to be proud that you belong to this. Everybody can't. We are a select group. And we have a mission that do. And we have a mission that no one else can do. There's no one in the world that can fix rummies but you and I. Remember that. You and I are the only experts in fixing rummies. We can talk to anybody. I don't care if he's a head of a multi-million dollar outfit or if he's a guy that's peddling something on the street. We can talk to him and we can help him change his life or her life. There's a lot of hers coming in now. And did I ever catch hell for that? I brought the first women in AA. Doc Smith and, and Bill Wilson were hooey on women. They want nothing to do with alcoholic women. 
They're afraid they would corrupt the men, I guess. <laughs> Boy, they're coming in by the hundreds now. I wouldn't be a bit surprised that in the last few years there's been more women from the AA than there have been men. And they're making it. Okay? They're finally coming out of that closet. Finally get rid of that guilt. Finally find out there's other people had this and they weren't what people told them they were. And they got a good feeling about themselves. This is what we need is a good feeling about ourselves. All of us, everybody's told us what bums we were and we did our best to prove it. <laughs> but now we have to have a feeling that we are somebody. And I'll tell you one thing, sure as shooting, I've been around a long time. I'm 80 years old. And I've seen alcoholics for a good many years. And I'll lay anybody bets that we are the most prolific, smartest bunch of people in society. Alcoholics can do things that other people, they get things done before people are thinking about them. They think we act. Alcoholics never think about anything, they just do it. I've often said that an alcoholic can operate on probably 20% of his efficiency upstairs here and beat the socks off of ordinary people that are operating on 80% of theirs. I've seen this in business, I've seen it in, among salesmen, among people in all walks of life. They're sharp. They're, they get things done. If once you get this program into your heart and into yourself, you really believe it and are doing it, man, there's no, no, there's no end to what can happen to you. I can stand here and talk for hours about miracles that have happened in my life and in Grace's life and in the lives of people that we know. There are miracles. I don't, and most, most people, they feel so, they're just down and they're whipped, they're beaten. An alcoholic with this program can never be whipped. He can't ever be whipped. Never, never. If you're playing on this, play, playing, if you're paying attention to your program. It's impossible. <laughs> well, I've talked long enough. Does anybody want to start an argument or ask me any questions? I'll be glad to do so. If you think I said something you don't understand, I'll be glad to try to explain it. But I speak pretty plain English. Maybe not the best, but I get along. <coughs> and I'm having a good life. I had a good life, and I had a good opportunity to think about that a few weeks ago when I had a heart attack. I never had anything happen to me as serious, really. And it came sudden. And I wound up in the hospital for a couple of weeks. And I'm on more pills than, than, than Carter has. But I'm glad they're not the same kind. <laughs> but I had a lot of, I had things to think about. I had things to think about when Grace was so sick so many times in the hospital. And when you're in this program, you get an entirely different light on these different things. <coughs> you get to thinking about you know, things come in a different dimension to us when we're, when we're on this program. And it's the greatest thing in the world. And we, you and I, we all have this opportunity. All we have to do is jump into it. Get somebody to help us teach us, and then we go out and do the teaching. It's great. Well, thanks for listening, and God bless all of you. You want to say something? Clarence, could you tell, I know it's, you know, you're tired, but could you tell that prodigal son Romy story out of the Bible for, for us one day, please? <clears throat> oh. Well, sometimes when I talk, I talk about rummies in the Bible. There are a lot of good rummy stories in the Bible. So the story he refers to are these two boys. 
they, they're Jewish boys, and the father has a farm. He has a lot of cattle and sheep and goats, no hogs. <laughs> <laughs> Big spread. And these two boys work for the dad, for the father, the older son and the younger son. Well, the older son, he does more than he's supposed to do. He is really elegant. He just, he just overdoes it. So he's the al -Anon kid. He goes, he does everything. <laughs> <laughs> then the younger son, guess who? This young one, he always is bothering his dad, his father. He says, you know, when, uh, in those days when the father died, the property is divided between the boys. So this young son, <laughs> doesn't want to wait till some indeterminate time in the future when his father turns his toes up and dies. He's young and he wants his right now so he can go out and enjoy it, see? So he keeps bugging his father and bugging his father and bugging his father for his share of the loot. So finally the father can't take it any longer. He says, okay, take your share and be gone. So he gives him his share of the loot. And away goes this kid. So what does it say in the Bible? This kid, he went into a far country and he squandered his substance in riotous living. Did you ever hear anything like that? <laughs> He blew the whole bundle, <laughs> and he's broke, and he's tapped out, and that isn't the worst. A famine <coughs> sets in, and he's way out in this strange country, miles and miles from home, and he can't get any work, and he can't get a job, he can't get anything to eat, and he's broke. <coughs> Everything's gone. He's washed out, <coughs> tapped out. So. Finally, what happened, some fella gave him a job on his farm. Now this didn't happen to be a Jewish farm, it was a Gentile farm. And they raised hogs. And they gave this, he, this kid a job nursing these hogs, <laughs> feeding the hogs and taking care of the hogs, this Jewish kid. Well, that, and did he eat what the hogs ate? Ha, 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 no, sir. It says in the Bible, he ate of the husks of the hogs. He ate what the hogs wouldn't eat. That's what he got to eat. I'd say this kid just about hit his bottom, wouldn't you? <laughs> Finally, he said something very important. He says, I starve. My father has much. His servants eat well. And then he said something very important. He says, I will arise and go to my father. That's what you and I had to do. Mm -hmm. okay? And I will tell him I'm unworthy and I'll be as one of his servants. Okay? So he had to do what you and I had to do. He had to get off his duff and move. And he started back that long, treacherous, trip home, those hundreds of miles, broke, sick, worn out. And he got back there and uh, did his father chew him out? <coughs> no, it says in the Bible, his father saw him coming afar off. And he ran to him and he fell on his neck and kissed him. He says, my son who is dead is alive. Let us make merry, let us have a party, let's kill the calf. <coughs> My son who is dead is alive. Put a ring on his finger, shoes on his feet, a cloak on his back. Hey, he's my son. Well, the kid said, I'm not worthy of this. He says, I am your father, you are my son. Remember that. You are the son, you are the daughter of your father. So, Meantime, the other, the al kid, he's out there working away as usual. Good <laughs> Al-Anon should. And 
Uh, he hears all this noise up at the house, all this music going. Boy, they're dancing and singing and having a great old time up there having a feast. And a servant came by. And he says to this servant, hey, what's all that racket up at the house I hear? He says, haven't you heard? He said, heard what? He says, your brother came back. <laughs> he says, oh, he's that dirty no good. <laughs> so then he dropped his tools and he went up to the house and confronted his father, which is a human thing. He says, father, I have been a good son to you I have done everything that you wanted me to do and more. This no good brother of mine goes out and squanders everything on high life and blows the whole bit and he comes home and you have a party for him. You never had a party for me, father. Now that's very human. Well, that's a great story of redemption, a great story of forgiveness. and. Father had to explain to the son why this was. This kid was already gone, but he came back. It's like you and I, we were completely gone. We blew the whole bundle. We blew the whole thing. We wound up on our butt. We ate with the hogs. We had to come back and depend upon the father. We had the same thing that kid had. Only I think the Bible had a much better way of putting it. Thanks for asking. Thank